Here we have the second lecture in a series of three lectures covering basic dermatology. In this first case, we have a patient with several papules on their face, some are erythematous. There are also blackheads or comedones. And this is a photo showing quite intensive scarring. This patient has acne. Now, acne is a chronic inflammatory condition of the pilus sebaceous follicles. It's very common, affecting mostly teenagers. The incidence is similar between males and females, and about 1% of men and 5% of women will still have acne at the age of 40. The etiology, there are several things that are thought to cause acne. It may run in the family, hormones, male hormones, androgens, abnormal keratin formation as the result of androgen and cosmetics, and also bacteria. Propiobacterium acnes is a normal skin commensal, but is present in large numbers in obstructed follicles and produces inflammatory mediators. Acne subtypes include drug-induced, such as corticosteroids and androgens, cosmetic acne due to greasy cosmetic preparations, occupational, exposure to oils and tars, mechanical, pressure from an object, for example, a violin, and infantile, which affects mainly boys less than five years old. The clinical features are characterized by inflamed papules, pustules, comedones, cysts, and scars. Acne treatment. Whether or not to start someone on acne treatment depends on the severity of the condition, but also on the emotional and social impact the condition is having on the person. All treatment modalities can take up to three months to achieve their maximal benefit. Diet has been found to be of little benefit. In a clinical setting, generally you'll start with topical agents such as clindamycin, erythromycin, benzoyl peroxide and retinoid creams and gels. On this can be added oral antibiotics such as doxycycline, minocycline, erythromycin. The oral contraceptive pill in ladies can be very helpful if it contains, particularly if it contains an antiandrogen such as ciproterone acetate. An example is this, of this is Diane 35. And then Roaccutane, which can only be prescribed by dermatologists, is probably the most effective treatment we have to date, though it has side effects such as depression, possibly suicide, though that is debatable, dry skin and mucous membranes, lipid abnormalities and photosensitivity. Here we have a young child with scaly skin behind, in, behind the knees, a um, slightly older patient with red scaly eroded skin on the palm surface of the arm, the cubital fossa and the wrist. And then around the lips, there is some scale and erythema inflammation of the tissue. This is atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis. Eczema is a common inflammatory condition, especially in children. And the prevalence is about one in five in the less than four year old age group. There's an association with asthma and hay fever, and it may be something that runs in the family and usually improves with age. There is something called the hygiene hypothesis, which basically states that the low exposure to dirt and infection in infancy may explain the increasing prevalence. So being overly clean and using disinfecting wipes and not exposure to the environmental elements may have a role. Clinically, the skin is dry, red, itchy and inflamed. In babies, eczema can affect the face, trunk and limbs, 
And as children become older, it may confine itself to the flexural surfaces, popliteal fossa, cubital fossa, wrists and ankles. The skin can become thickened and rough, a light chant fine. With treatment, the initial and most important treatments are copious amounts of moisturiser, something simple like sorbeline with 10% glycerin is ideal. Avoid excessive soap and water, which may clean away the normal skin oily lining and expose the skin to harsh environment, environmental elements. Avoid overheating and irritating clothing. Topical corticosteroids are a mainstay treatment and there are various strengths to use. The cream, the strength of cream to use on the face is generally 1% hydrocortisone, though treatment of other parts of the body may require a stronger cortisone. And then there's ointments versus creams. The ointments may work better, but tend to be very greasy. And the creams are a bit more easy to use in that they're not greasy, they don't dirty clothes, uh, but they may not be as effective. Generally, the choice is up to the patient. Using sedating antihistamines at night, such as Phenergan, can help with symptoms. And topical Elidel is a calcineurin antagonist, and it has a role, uh, particularly if the parents of the child are adverse to using topical steroids. And then there's environmental measures which may help, such as diet, house dust mites, but addressing these issues tends to achieve only sporadic and limited success. Here is a chart which contains the common steroids used and the various potencies of these creams and ointments. How much cream and how strong cortisone cream should be used. Basically, you should be using the, the lowest strength cream or ointment that keeps the condition under control. Often with using cortisone creams or ointments, you'll start in a stronger dose to get the rash under control, and then you can reduce the dose to the least required strength. There are other forms of dermatitis, such as contact dermatitis. Here is a case of irritant dermatitis, where the child has been licking their lips and the saliva is causing irritation or breakdown in the, in the skin surface. Though irritant dermatitis can be caused by other things, such as soap, water, detergents and shampoos. Here's a very classic case of a delayed allergic contact dermatitis. And in this case, the person has applied a dressing with a non-stick pad in the center, island in the center, and surrounded by the sticky material, which has caused a blistering of the skin. This is un undoubtedly not the first time they've used the dressing because subsequent uses or subsequent contacts with these antigens will cause worsening symptoms. Common things which people may have a contact allergic dermatitis to are adhesive plasters, nickel, rubber, wood, plants. Lichen planus. This is a uncommon condition, possibly a rare condition, where the person will develop purplish or violaceous polygonal plaques, which may be itchy, may be very itchy, but not always. In the mouth or on the mucous membrane, there may be Wickham stray, which is a web-like white change on the mucous membrane. And this is just an example of what's called the Coebner phenomenon, where someone may have some sort of dermatitis, in this case it's lichen planus, the area is traumatised, and then the dermatitis basically tracks down that area of trauma. 
As we said, lichen planus is not common. It's thought to be an autoimmune process where lymphocytes attack the epidermal basal cells. There's usually no known trigger, though some drugs can cause a lichen planus rash, such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. It can be extremely itchy, though it's often asymptomatic. It can or often resolves at about nine months, though it can be persistent and become a chronic condition. This can be diagnosed histologically using a small biopsy, and it can affect the nails, leading to destruction of the finger and toenails. The treatment involves the use of potent topical steroids. Oral prednisone may be necessary if the condition is problematic. And then immunosuppressant medication, such as cyclosporin, may also be used. This is an interesting case, and here we may have a geriatric patient in a nursing home. There may be a degree of dementia, and they'll present with a area of red inflamed eroded skin, maybe a bit of like chenification. And in these, it's important to keep an open mind. This is a case of lichen simplex, or otherwise known as localized neurodermatitis. Now, the thickening is caused due to the inflammation, the rubbing, scratching, causing the skin to become leathery. And as far as we can tell, there is no underlying skin disorder here. We will talk about that in the next slide. And this is particularly common in the 30 to 50 year old age group. And tends to affect females at a greater rate than males. So what is thought to happen is there might be some sort of initiating factor, such as an insect bite or an itchy spot. This will then cause the person to scratch the area, which liberates, um, liberates um, chemicals and mediators, which may actually cause an itch, and then sets up this cycle of scratching and itching. You need to consider depression, anxiety, and stresses, which may be provoking this. And the treatment is about breaking that cycle of scratching. Topical steroids may assist in reducing the itch and inflammation and sedating antihistamines at night may also be useful. Very typical case here, we've got the elbows of a patient with red plaques and adherent white silvery scale the similar condition on the knees, and this is the scale being rubbed away. And of course, this is psoriasis. Psoriasis is actually common, affecting about two to 3% of the population. It results in increased thickness of the epidermis, more rapid keratinization, dilation of blood vessels in the dermis. There may be a gene genetic predisposition and it, it appears to have an autoimmune etiology. Of course, as with many skin conditions, it can be worsened with external factors such as stress. This is the classical plaque type psoriasis, where you have a slowly evolving scaly red plaque, which is well raised and well demarcated. The scale is silvery and gentle scraping reveals pinpoint bleeding and typically in plaque-like psoriasis, it can affect the knees, elbows, scalp, base of the spine, and umbilicus. In, fle in flexures, the moisture and rubbing may uh, eliminate the scale, and so it may just look like a red, shiny area. It can affect the scalp. Again, typical red, scaly plaques. There are different types of psoriasis. For example, pustular psoriasis, which is a chronic condition affecting the palms and soles of the feet. It's quite acute and is associated with fever and toxicity, though luckily this is a fairly rare condition. There is guttate or drop-like psoriasis, which can be widespread, forming small 
papular areas on the trunk particularly. And of course nails can be commonly affected with psoriasis. We may have pitting of the nails, onycholysis, we have separation of the nail from the underlying nail bed, and then some subungual hyperkeratosis or thickening of the nail. There are many treatments for psoriasis and sh these should be tailored according to the individual patient. The treatment is uh, fundamentally symptomatic and one needs to take into account the social and emotional impact of the disease as this can be quite significant and should be addressed. Topical treatments can be burdensome, though the best first, first line approach. You initially start with emollients such as Sorbeline or the QV range. There are various tar based shampoos and creams over the counter which can be used or recipes can be prescribed which contain tar and salicylic acid. Dithranol, not used as commonly these days by any means, is quite effective. That's quite a messy stain in topical treatment that can be bur that can burn the skin. So it has to be up titrated in strength, though generally it is safe and effective. The vitamin, vitamin D analog cream, such as Davinox, are good for when the psoriasis has been stabilized to keep the psoriasis in a stabilized fashion. And to stabilize psoriasis, usually you need a topical steroid, usually a fairly potent topical steroid due to the thickened skin. You can get combinations of the Davinex and topical steroids, which can be applied to the areas of psoriasis, which is helpful because the topical steroid will work reasonably quickly. And over time, the Davinex will begin to work and suppress the psoriasis. And with time, the topical steroid may be dropped and the patient may be changed to just the plain Davinex cream without the steroid, using the steroid when needed. Narrowband UVB treatment or sun exposure can be very effective, though precaution needs to be taken to avoid excessive exposure. And then failing these, immunosuppressants such as methotrexate, cyclosporin and other newer agents may be necessary with, with recalcitrant widespread psoriasis. In this case, we have a gentleman with a slightly bulbous nose and telangiectasia, as well as telangiectasia on his chin. More progression has occurred where the person has developed quite thickened nasal skin, which is called rhinophyma. And a close look at the skin will reveal pustules, though no comedones. This is rosacea. In rosacea, you get erythematous papules and pustules on the background of erythema and telangiectasia. It's roughly symmetrical and it can result in rhinophyma, which we discussed, which is the bulbous overgrowth of nasal sebaceous glands. Often rosacea will affect the cheeks, chin, forehead and nose, but there are no comedones, which will help distinguish it from acne. Generally, it tends to occur in fair-skinned, middle-aged adults, and the cause is unknown. Treatments such as topical metronidazole gel and or oral doxycycline or erythromycin can be very effective. And laser, either vascular laser to reduce the telangiectasia, or say CO2 laser to thin down the skin on the, the nose to prevent, to alleviate the rhinophyma can both be very effective cosmetically. In this case we have an older person where there has been quite distinct loss of pigment with a sharp demarcation between the loss of pigment and the normal pigment. A very uh, very obvious case here and this is a vitiligo. 
This oligo is an acquired loss of skin pigmentation due to autoimmune attack on the melanocytes, the pigment producing cells. And it's not uncommon at all. And it can be familial, run in families. It appears gradually. And particularly in children, it can resolve spontaneously. Though in older people, it usually progresses and usually does not resolve. There is really no treatment for vitiligo. You need sun protection to avoid burning of the areas which have lost pigment. Sun exposure will also make the condition more prominent as the normal skin will become browner, though the vitil vitiligo skin will not. Occasionally potent topical steroids have been found to help and the basic treatment is basically just to camouflage the area if the patient is cosmetically concerned, camouflaged with, with um, pigmented uh, cosmetics. Here we have another facial condition, though in this case there is quite confluent erythema around the eyebrows, nose, malar regions and chin and a close look will demonstrate a fine scale on the skin. Here the scale is quite obvious in the eyelashes and eyebrow and again showing the distribution of erythema and scale. This is seborrheic dermatitis. So as we said, you get a fine scale and a slightly erythematous diffuse base affecting the brows, lashes, nasolabial, moustache and beard areas and ears are also commonly affected. There may be some itching, uh, there may be some scalp scale, plus or minus itch. Pterosporum ovale, which is part of the normal flora, may be playing a role, though it is difficult to know. And treatment for this condition, there are a few treatments such as mild topical steroids, 1% hydrocortisone can reduce the, reduce the redness and scale and anti-dandruff shampoos in the scalp. Drug reactions can present in numerous different ways. We have widespread red macular rash. Here we have almost an erythema multiform type rash. And you can also have a fixed drug reaction. A fixed drug reaction is where someone may be exposed to a medication, get a dermatitis in a specific area, stop the medication, the dermatitis will resolve. And upon recommencing the medication, the dermatitis or skin changes will recur in the same area. Medications are very common, rashes are very common, but in clinical practice, rashes are usually not caused by medications. We will cover that a bit more. So there's a variety of potential presentations, urticaria, angioedema, anaphylaxis, toxicity, epidermal necrolysis, photosensitivity, purpura, acne form, pustular eruptions, psoriasis form, and er erythematosum, etc. Now, with a typical, say, penicillin allergy, the most common reaction is a widespread itchy macular rash occurring within two weeks after starting the medication. Every drug can cause a rash, when reading the product information. However, as we said, rashes are usually not due to medication unless there is a close temporal link. So if someone starts a medication and soon after starting they develop a rash or the rash may even develop after stopping the medication, if the medication has only been going for say one or two weeks, then that must, um, that must point the practitioner to considering a drug reaction and if the drug reaction is not too severe then reintroduction of the medication to see if the rash can be precipitated may be an option, certainly not an option if there's any risk of anaphylaxis 
and patients may often say that they've got a rash and they feel it is the medication. The only way really to test this with long-term medications is to stop the medication and see what happens. Though usually rashes are not due to the medication. That is the end of lecture two. We will be presenting lecture three shortly and I hope you've learned something from that and enjoyed the lecture. If you have any comments, please feel free to leave them below. Thank you very much for watching.